Good afternoon. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media Webinars. Welcome to today's webinar on ESG in mining, where a panel will unpack initiatives to promote ESG and sustainability in mining. Today's webinar is sponsored by SRK Consulting, BME, and Expotential Mining Services. We thank them for their support in making this webinar possible. Before we begin, please be aware that we have enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists may not be able to answer all of your questions during today's hour-long webinar, but we will read through all of them. We've also enabled the chat facility so you can post your comments in the chat. You'll also find this at the bottom of your screen. Please do not, however, post any questions in the chat as we may miss them. Post all your questions into the Q&A instead. Please be aware we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Emily Gammon, an associate at Weber Wenzel. Emily has experience in corporate and commercial matters with a particular focus on the mining industry. She also has experience in public interest litigation and ESG projects. Emily will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which includes Vota Jordan, a principal environmental scientist and partner at SRK Consulting. Nishen Hari Prasad, the technology and marketing division leader at BME. Thomas Gustafsson, the CEO of Hypex Bioexplosives Technology. Joshua Kilani, the MD of Expotential Mining Services, or XMS. And Marcus Birch, Executive for Sustainability and Business Support at Orion Minerals. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Emily Gammon, to get the discussion started. Over to you, Emily. Thanks so much, Shannon, and thanks to everyone for joining today's webinar. Um, we've got some very impressive CVs on the panel today, so I'm going to just take another minute or two to run through those and introduce our panelists in more detail. First of all, we have Bota Jordan from SRK Consulting. Bota completed his BSc Honours in Environmental Management and GIS at the University of Johannesburg and joined SRK in 2003. He's currently a partner at SRK South Africa, a director of SRK DRC, and has a focus on battery minerals. His expertise includes environmental and social due diligence, permitting, closure planning, and responsible mining and sourcing. Next, we have Marcus Birch from Orion Minerals. Marcus holds a BSc Honours in Geology from the University of Exeter and a BCom from the University of South Africa. He boasts more than 30 years in mining and minerals exploration experience. Beginning as a geologist at Anglo Val, he transitioned to procurement and supply chains at Anglo Gold Ashanti, leading a global sourcing strategies. From 2008, Marcus held senior roles at Clarity Minerals and HPX, managing projects in Africa, Australia, and South America. Since 2017, he has contributed as part of Orion Minerals' executive team. Next up, we have Nishen Hariparsad from BME. Um, Nishen has over 25 years of industry experience and has worked at leading explosives providers like Sassel, Orica, Davy Bickford, and NAX. He holds a degree in chemical engineering and an MBA. Since joining BME in May 2022, he has led the technology and marketing division. I then come to Thomas Gustafsson from Hypex Bio. Thomas holds a master's degree in electrical engineering from the Royal Technical Academy in Stockholm. Since 2006, he has focused on developing and commercializing energetic materials and products. In 2020, Thomas became CEO of Hypex Bio. And last but not least, we have Joshua Kilani from Expotential Mining Services. Joshua is a consulting exploration geologist with over 12 years of experience, and he holds an MSc in mining engineering from the University of Witwatersrand. He has managed exploration programs globally and worked in brownfields exploration for multinational mining companies. Recently, Joshua has been a carbon consultant consultant for the mining, investment and banking sectors, utilizing his expertise with UNFCCC regulatory bodies. So we really have a wonderful panel today, uh, representative of many voices within the mining industry. I think what's particularly interesting about our panel today is this mixture of perspectives from technical compliance to ESG and sustainability. Um, for me as a lawyer, that bridge from compliance to creating lasting sustainability solutions is really exciting and such an, 
amazing journey to be on. Um, so I hope that today's discussion will bring out some of those nuances from the E, the S and the G um, and the technical and compliance work which embeds those considerations into the industry. So without any further introduction, I'd like to get right into the panel discussion. I'm going to start out with Vota Yordan. Um, and Vota, my first question for you is from your experience of working in Africa and specifically in South Africa, how is ESG creating value and resulting in sustainable mining legacies in South Africa? Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you everyone for, for joining today. Um, yeah, I think, you know, if you look at ESG now, that's evolved over time. You know, ESG used to be mainly governed by regulatory requirements in different countries. And it's really evolved to a point now where, you know, it's not really the regulatory requirements that are really driving ESG. It is more your, your external factors, your shield activism. You know, people really want to know whether something is mined um, responsibly, et cetera. And, you know, we, we're seeing a whole landscape changing. I mean, uh, you know, if we look at the various aspects of driving ESG there, you know, it's, it's a constantly changing um, <clears throat> area at, at the moment. So, yeah, what, what we're seeing at the moment with ESG is, you know, uh, companies are embedding it in the DNA. So, if, you know, from a board level, the decisions are being made and filtered through through the mining companies. And what is really uh, happening now is that, um, you know, ESG is considered really at the outset of mining operations when the mine is being planned right through to closure. And in doing that, um, you know, the mining companies are realizing um, that, you know, they, they can take accountability um, throughout uh, the, the, the journey, uh, the mining journey, and they also can be proactive. So you don't need to deal with, um, you know, compliance issues throughout the mining, um, you know, throughout mining, you know, you can predict um, certain aspects, you know, you've got good models and technologies, you know, that you can latch onto, um, you know, and I guess, you know, that, that creates a whole new, um, you know, if you look at the at the legacies previously, you know, of old mine, uh, you know, um, all all tailings facilities and waste rock dumps uh, that nobody wanted to take, um, um, you know, how can I put it, um, responsibility for in the past, you know, uh, you know, that you you can't hide around those things anymore. So I think that landscape has evolved quite significantly. Um, you know, if we look at uh, closure, there are various um, standards uh, in place now. You know, we, we've seen quite recently with the ICMM, you know, including this uh, social transitioning to closure. Um, and, you know, we are seeing some very big changes happening, um, you know, around around us, those aspects at the moment. So a lot of the mining companies are voluntary, uh, uh, you know, um, join these, these, um, these organizations on a voluntary basis. But they embedded in the DNA. So we're really seeing a big move away from regulatory compliance to, to embedding ESG in into um into a company's uh, our company functions in it, into its DNA. Thanks, Rota. And I think just touching on that on that issue of voluntary con contributions of mining companies and how mining companies are really embedding this into their DNA, I want to turn to Marcus from Orion Minerals, um, taking that question of creating value to the specific operational level. So Marcus, as a junior miner with a limited budget, how does Orion Minerals ensure that it is a positive catalyst in its host communities through ESG? Thanks, Well, I think some of what I'll say is gonna echo quite strongly with what Vota just um, explained, but um, certainly as a, as a junior um, explorer developer operating in South Africa, we don't have the, the resources of the established majors. So we, We've had to evolve, let's call it a, a pragmatic fit for purpose approach, but it is absolutely baked into the way that Orion does business. It's integral to the Orion way of, of doing business. And it's something that we focused on right from the start, where we first have got involved in our project areas, which um, for those of you familiar with Orion Minerals will know are in impoverished and underinvested areas of the Northern Cape. Um, so, um, you know, despite the long lead time that um, a junior company explorer such as ourselves has from establishing an exploration presence through to, um, producing, to a producing operation, I mean, globally, there are statistics now that says that time lag can be nine, up to 19 years. We've, we've managed to shorten that here to about seven years, but it's still a long lead time where expectations are created 
um, particularly amongst the, the, the host communities where you establish yourselves. So, you know, we, we um, took a very deliberate dis decision right from the start to, to follow a, let's call it a very deliberate approach to our ESG and particularly the social aspects of that in the areas that we operate in, uh, in the Northern Cape. When you, when you get into those areas, the first, there's two things that people are interested in. It's jobs and it's procurement opportunities for small businesses in that area. We can't provide instant opportunities, but what we can do is focus on preparing those host communities for the future opportunities that the mining operations will have and bridging the gap between um, the existing capabilities within the community and what will be required by the operations. So we've got a, we've almost developed a process. We've rolled it out in September for our um, Prisca Copper Zinc project there. And we're in the process of rolling out a very similar sort of template in um, Namakoi district for the um, O'Keep Copper project. So typically, you know, it revolves around deploying local presence in terms of a CSD, a community social development or community liaison officer, opening a community liaison office, establishing a broad based stakeholder engagement forum. One of the things that we've done, which I think has been very successful, is um, establishing online CV or employment database and procurement databases where we can collect information about local capability and then drawing from this to undertake occupational assessments of, of local individuals upon which we can base our training and development programs. And likewise, in terms of suppliers, it's using it's undergoing a vetting process of host community um, businesses so that we can understand the capability and, and then identify those companies that have the potential to be developed as we develop and implement uh, our, our minds or develop our minds and move into the operational phase. We can selectively bring host community um, uh, businesses along with us. Um, so we've, as I said, we've, 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 we have consciously from the start um, set, along with the community, set aspirational targets for host community involvement in employment of 50% and procurement of 30%. And we're putting in these building blocks to help us get there jointly with the communities. I should also say, I think that, you know, even though we're a junior, we have to comply with um, South African mining legislation. And I think to a large extent, ESG principles are already pretty well baked into um, other legislation. So, you know, the fact that we have to put together a social and labor plan, the fact that we have to put together an environmental authorization, they encapsulate world class um, aspects um, that, that, that make it, you know, that facilitate, if you like, um, the, the achievement of our ESG um, uh, goals. Um, through these regulatory sort of environments. I'm not saying that we rely solely on that, but I do think South Africa's got a very mature ESG uh, regulatory framework in that respect. Thank you, Marcus. Um, yeah, I think Marcus has, has explained so clearly how the ESG framework in South Africa really lends itself to the mining, to the mining sector. But I want to now ask Joshua, um, what your view is on on whether the mining sector is playing a leading role in ESG uptake in South Africa and and sticking with some of these kind of practical um, explanations that Marcus has given us of the of of what they've been doing. Um, what is XMS's contribution in that regard? Um, thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't categorically say that. Uh, the mining industry is taking a leading role in all aspects of, of ESG, but uh, the stage is certainly set uh, for it to take a key role. Um, like Walter said, the industry has you know, long grappled with matters of sustainability. Um, you know, from an environmental perspective, uh, resource management in itself is an environmental activity. It has a long legacy of environmental impact. Um, not only is the mining industry a significant contributor to things like uh, carbon emissions, but it's also usually the first uh, source of, of these emissions in, in, in most production value chains. Um, so if you look at the current ESG pool factors, I mean, those are primarily centered around decarbonization and environmental protection. And look, none of this is altruistic and, you know, it's not, it's not all, uh, you know, tree tree hugging and happy it's just you know actual facts it's it's 
you know, the climate change uh, dilemma poses significant problems and, and, and risk to human existence. And your environmental issues like biodiversity, I mean, those are, you know, biodiversity, the infrastructure that, that uh, secures and safeguards the, the Earth's existence, you know. So, so these pool factors are creating a business incentive and um you know companies are, are are engaging with it because that's the incentive coming from investors and that's the reason the investors and other stakeholders have have such in incentives you know from a social point of view mining definitely has you know been a significant sector in in south africa definitely has a lot of potential to take the lead uh in esg uptake you know, it, it provides uh, a lot of economic, social, infrastructural uh, benefits that could potentially contribute to sustainability and uh, delivering on the on the SDGs. And then, you know, there's also the simple fact that, you know, you can't have a green future without raw materials. And if, you know, there's that saying, if it ain't grown, it's mined. So, you know, the stage is certainly set for mining to take a key role um, and, uh, you know, like like Marcus mentioned as well, from a governance perspective, uh, most of the ESG imperatives are embedded in uh, mining law compliance. You know, so within the regulatory frameworks of NEMA and you know the Mine Health and Safety Act and the MPRDA, there is ESG elements in there as well. But I think the key for mining to get to that stage where it takes a leading role is it needs to move beyond just compliance, and it needs to actually move towards a more innovative, um, uh, you know, unconventional thinking approach. And that's what's going to allow mining with all the potential it has to, to take its rightful place and taking the lead in ESG uptake in, in South Africa. And then Thanks, I think Joshua. you asked what, what we do, our contribution uh, in, in this regard. Yeah, um, that would be great to hear. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, Again, we just are trying to assist the industry in leveraging that platform so that it can uh, take advantage of, of the benefits and position it, it plays and could play, potential position it could play in taking the ESG lead. Um, we firmly believe that uh, innovation and the technical know-how for innovation is embodied in the mining industry. Uh, so we come from the mining industry. Uh, you know, we're a bunch of earth scientists and engineers and all sorts of things for our sins in, in a previous life. Um, but, but you know, we see ourselves now as ESG enablers, you know, so our ESG business is built on two firm beliefs, and that's a belief in, in data and the fact that data is one of the most valuable resources in the world and also a belief in market-based mechanisms. So, you know, verifiable, quantifiable, provable, Data is key to unlocking critical insights and intelligence. And, um, you know, market-based mechanisms can provide that uh, monetary or financial leverage that help get marginal projects across the line. So we believe that there's a lot of potential in market-based mechanisms, uh, particularly on the African continent, to bridge that uh, funding gap that exists, that finance gap. And, and yeah, that's, you know, that's generally the role we play. It's centered around good quality data and leveraging market-based mechanisms. Thanks, Joshua. And that, that sets things up quite nicely because I'd like to turn now to, to discussing some of the more technical aspects. And um, as you've said, that that move from compliance to innovation, we've got some great examples of that on the panel today. Um, Nishen, I want to start with you from the BME perspective. Um, BME obviously supplies critical products to the mining industry throughout Africa, and that's a complex and critical supply chain and a crucial role um, to play. So, uh, Nishen, how is BME helping to ensure a sustainable value chain through its ESG roadmap by addressing carbon emissions, waste and integrity? Thanks for thanks thanks for the question, Emily, and, and hello everyone. Well, sustainability is an integral part of the way BME does business. Our sustainability framework is is underpinned by four key pillars: social responsibility, environmental stewardship, sustainable economic growth, and governance and compliance. And in terms of our products, 
solutions, partners, and commitment to the industry, these are centered around these pillars with the application of our systems. Uh, my colleague Joshua mentioned that uh, innovation is is the support that innovation is embodied in the in, 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 in the mining industry. And if I could give an example, you know, the industry is well aware of mining's reliance on electricity. And many firms have already sought means to move to autonomous energy inputs to reduce dependency on diesel generators, for example, and offset um, the cost of producing oil. There's one fundamental benefit that, that JME has implemented is, is the use of our access blasting system, um, which is through electronic blast initiation. Now, this is a way for mining companies to consume less energy. You see, blasting is a fundamental step in the mining process, and a quality blast will generate predictable consistency, mock piles, and, dil and dilution. This makes everything easier from digging to crushing to mold throughput and ore conversion. And in doing so, a good blast reduces carbon emissions, eliminates waste in the production chain, and makes for a more efficient mine. An efficient mine, in our view, is a greener mine. And, BME, and at BME, we have a duty of care to people, the environment, and provide innovative, intelligent, and sustainable solutions across the value chain in the industry. Thanks, Nishen, for that. And um, it really is so exciting to hear about that kind of approach from BME. I'd like to stick with the with the explosives technologies and, and move on to Thomas from um, Hypex Bio. So um, it's really exciting there to consider the technical innovation that is happening in, in the space of explosives. And Thomas, I'd like to ask you, what role are nitrate-free explosives playing in achieving ESG targets in the mining industry? And how do these nitrate-free explosives compare with traditional explosives technologies? Thank you so much, Emily. Um, thank you so much for having me on the call. I first just would like to, to say that uh, I really appreciate some comments from our colleagues here, especially Yosha, um, you know, really putting some emphasis on the importance of innovation and mining as a driver for the global society. Um, and I also would like to say that in terms of, of ESG sustainability practices, I would say that sustainability practices really connect into operation, uh, aligns with what Nishin just said in terms of efficiency good sustainable practices in terms of economical sustainability, environmental sustainability, and operational sustainability, alliance with profitability and economic sustainability. So I think that's that's kind of like the framework we're talking with sustainability. We have to look at all of these aspects. And if we look at the mining industry, now I'm Swedish. I'm sitting here talking to you from Stockholm, Sweden. So I'm not maybe not the expert on South African mining, but in mining in general, uh, we are looking at three three, let's say, verticals in terms of emissions. We're looking at electricity and energy, we're looking at fuels, and we're looking at explosives. From my side, those are the three main aspects. Explosives are probably the smallest part of emissions, but they contribute a significant amount of, of issues for the mining, mining side. Today, um, explosives are dependent on a very, you say, crucial raw material, which is ammonium nitrate, which is predominantly used in the chemical to, to um, produce traditionally um, emotions and alcohol use in the mining industry. And that leads to, to a plethora of well-defined problems, everything from gas emissions in post-detonation fumes to water pollutants such as ammonia and nitrates and so on and so forth. And we also know that ammonia, which is mainly, I mean, in terms of, of uh, nitrates, it's mainly used for fertilizer, which is crucial for the sustainability of, of, of humankind. So it closes a small part of modern nitrate, but it leads to, to issues in the mining industry. Um, and what we are trying to do with Hypex Bio is to remove the ammonium nitrate and replace it with hydroperoxide, which addresses some of these emission issues, both in terms of indirect emissions from production of raw materials, hydroperoxide are cleaner to produce, at least here in Northern Europe. Uh, we remove the nitrates and the ammonia, which eliminates the, the post-detonation fume toxicity, which mainly is uh, um, nitrate oxides, and also eliminates the, um, the water component, ammonia and the nitrate leaching in the water. And I believe a country, an arid country such as South Africa, I think uh, having 
good uh, governance in your water treatment is, is one of those crucial ESG parts that more address health and safety and social sustainability rather than emissions. So those are those are the things that we focused on mainly, and that's the core value drive of what we're doing. And to your other question in terms of performance, we've spent a lot of time ensuring that our technology uh, is, let's say, operationally non-disruptive. And this means for Scandinavian markets, which we operate in, we have technology that looks the same, is used the same, and has very similar results in terms of performance in order to have a smooth transition into the mining industry, which very understandably is hesitant to, to shift energetic product products, the risk profile is high. So I think we have succeeded in that here in, in Sweden and in, in Norway, our products are used in, in similar ways with similar performance. Thanks for that, Thomas. And it's, yeah, it really is incredible to hear about that kind of innovation that's being used so successfully. I think I'd like to stick a little bit with this um, discussion on emissions and um, and carbon neutrality because um, there's a lot of perspectives on that on this call. So I'd like to start with Joshua. Um, it obviously is such a challenge to transform the mining industry to a cleaner industry, and we've we've heard some examples now of how this is happening. How is XMS helping the mining industry turn emissions challenges into opportunities? Uh, thanks, Emily. Um... Yeah, and you know that's a that's 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 a you know valid valid question, and I think just from a business management perspective, whenever there's a challenge, you know that that means there's there's opportunity as well, and it's all about just applying yourselves to 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 create an opportunity out of the the, the present challenges. So I think right off the bat, the lowest hanging fruit for companies is to understand that. A positive decarbonization performance relative to your peers is in itself a competitive advantage. Um, but beyond that, you know, what we try and do at, at XMS is we try to leverage the monetary power of the voluntary carbon markets or your sustainability markets to facilitate accelerated transition to a to a low carbon economy. You know, so that the role of market-based mechanisms uh in the mining industry, you know, the mining industry can really is, is a prime example of an industry that can really leverage um, what market-based mechanisms have to offer. You know, it um, if you look at mineral processing and how cost intensive it is, and um, also how R and D in that space is also quite costly. So, you know, the role of market-based mechanisms could incentivize companies to take on alternative solutions. Um, and 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 in doing so, you know, not take on as much of that financial risk. So a lot of marginal projects can kind of come across the line now because they have that funding gap is provided. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovative solutions out there. And sorry, Marcus, to put you on the spot, but you know, I've 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 come across some solutions Orion have ideated that are you know potentially very innovative. I mean, like your your vapor metallurgy. Um, uh, research that you were undertaking, you know, things like that um, are quite risky in nature, but they're cutting edge. And, you know, it really comes at an opportunity cost. So if market based mechanisms can uh, subsidize this cost, you'll see a lot more companies, you know, and, and like Marcus said, they, they, they're not quite a, a major miner. So, you know, the, the opportunity cost for them, you know, uh, investigating such alternate solutions is quite it comes at quite a premium to them you know and uh, so i think again if we just leverage all the tools in our in our esg and climate change toolkit which market based mechanisms are one of them it really can help in transitioning these challenges into opportunities and 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 catalyzing the ideas that come out of these uh, these technical hubs that again like we all are stating exist within the mining industry um, another thing about, you know, emissions and the markets and, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem without a border, you know, it's, it's a borderless problem. So it shouldn't be limited by geographic limits. And what your market-based mechanisms allow you to do again is it, it removes the, the necessity for geographic limitations in your mitigation solutions. Um, so it has massive potential to just broaden what you're able to do as a, mining company that 
is energy intensive, that does need to do a certain physical, you know, does live within certain real and physical constraints, scientific constraints. It does just open up uh, the, the realm of possibilities for, for companies within the industry. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of challenging, real physical scientific problems in the industry that, that require collective and multidisciplinary thinking to, to approach them. And, 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 uh, that, you know, that's, that's, that's what we try and do. Every case is a different case and we look at it uniquely. We understand the industry. We come from the industry and we just try and ideate novel, unconventional solutions to, to deal with, uh, with these, these future problems, if you want to call them that problems, you know, things we have to juggle that we never had to juggle before. Thanks, Joshua. Um, I think you've set set me up quite well because I wanted to go to Marcus next and I wanted to hear a bit more about what Orion Minerals is doing in this carbon neutrality space. So, um, Marcus, how have you weaved ESG into your business model through initiatives such as the carbon neutral roadmap and perhaps some of the initiatives that Joshua had also touched on? Well, thanks, Emily. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, look, obviously Orion is is aspiring to be a producer of the green future facing metals in support of this low carbon future that we are all envisaging and 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 in pursuing um this objective obviously we are um we are investigating and and, and actively progressing sometimes on the on the almost on the bleeding edge <laughs> in terms of, of technological uh, solutions that can support that strategy so maybe just two that i can I can just talk to you um, quickly. The one is the one that Joshua just mentioned, actually, which is, um, you know, we're pioneering research into this metal vapor refining technology for the, <laughs> for the production of high purity specialist metal ultra fine powders that are used in the electronics and um, chemical industries. Um, and we're, we're looking at application, particularly on our Yucca Mainspan project, which is an early stage exploration project um uh, copper cobalt nickel um pge um uh, very very exciting um uh, project um but you know that it, it really this type of technology really is um is is going to be the 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 deal maker if you like in terms of the economic viability of such a deposit um and and obviously with this this type of me uh, metal vapor technology has a, a significantly lower carbon and a lighter environmental footprint than traditional um, uh, refining technology. So that's one that we're very excited about and that we're, that we're pushing hard. And I'll certainly uh, talk to Joshua offline around, you know, how there might be some synergies with his, with his initiatives. Um, and I think the other one is, is around um, our use of uh, or planned use of renewable energies as part of our um, power solution for our um, developing projects, both at Prisca um, and at um, O'Keep, and, and obviously potentially at Yakamain's Pan when we get there. Um, you know, I think we're blessed in that the Northern Cape, where our projects are located, is probably one of the best locations in the world for renewable energy, both in terms of solar radiation and and consistent um, wind. So it's a it's a natural magnet for renewable energy projects, both wind and solar PV, and there are ex many existing ones and. And obviously a lot more planned, but the the the, the, the ones that are in the planning are, are currently a, you know subject to limitations because of the ESCOM and grid con constraints, which we hope are in the process of being resolved. Um, and what we're seeing is, you know, since we started looking at this in, in our early studies, is that the renewable energy space is evolving and maturing very fast at the moment. I mean, we're literally being inundated by um, options at the moment from renewable energy solution providers or potential providers. And that ranges from these sort of new one-stop shop wheeling solutions where you literally pay a per kilowatt hour rate that's often promised to be at a significant discount to what the ESCOM rate would be through to behind the meter sort of captive developments um, that where obviously we are ideally located if we were to go down that route. And I think that what we do have is the benefit of of time on our on our on our on our side. I mean, we're entering into the development phase for our project, for our projects. So 
Um, you know, we're taking time to evaluate um, these from obviously a technical and commercial basis and, and to identify the best options that will um, meet our aspirational um, carbon emission reduction targets uh, over time. So, yeah, there's a couple of examples of, 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 of how we're trying to um, move forward in terms of our carbon neutral roadmap. Thanks, Emily. Thanks so much, Marcus. And, and Marcus, and that really does sound very exciting. Um, I almost called you market, which shows what an influence you're having. <laughs> um, I I just want to touch now on something that uh, that Joshua mentioned about about collective and multidisciplinary approaches, which is obviously how we achieve so much of this uh, of this um, innovation. And I want to go here to Nishin um, from BME. Um, we know that um, partnerships are so critical to realizing ESG goals. Um, so, Nishen, what is BME's relationships with relationship with Hypex Bio, and how will the relationship help in achieving ESG targets? Well, Emily, um, BME understands the importance and the growing demand for for reduced carbon technologies. Within the mining sector, we have seen a significant need for decarbonized mining with most of BME's value customers now publishing their, their own carbon reduction uh, commitments. In order for Omnia and BME to be a collaborative partner to the mining industry, it is vital that, that we meet this pressing need. We've, we have an emulsion system called Innovex. And if I can just expand on its waste oil value proposition. Or rather, or rather, let me expand on, on the nitrate system that it possesses. So it's important to note that emulsion systems used in blasting use nitrate inherently. Right? And our Innovex emulsion system uses a dual nitrate system that by default consumes almost 50% less ammonia than conventional single salt or single nitrate emulsion systems. Now, this is a direct benefit in minimizing ammonia leaching in mine waters uh, and reducing toxic NOx fumes or emissions in, in the blasting phase. And looking ahead to building a greener industry and achieving ESG targets, BME's strate a strategic partnership with Hypex Bio is an investment in the future of mining, of, of the mining industry. Traditional exposures, as I just mentioned, are nitrate-based, which discharges carbon dioxide during the blasting process. And hydrogen peroxide technology, such as that used by, by Hypex Bio, is currently one of the only technologies with a path to carbon-free blasting, reducing carbon by up to 90% in raw materials, production, and transport. As, as always, you know, every, every business decision we take is aligned with our purpose in our business. And that is innovating to enhance life together, creating a greener future. This is a fundamental reason for partnering with a like-minded partner like Hypex Bio to step into a new era of more sustainable and safer blasting. This partnership coupled with our used oil emulsion technology and our digital blasting solutions contributes to BME's commitment to being a sustainable and, respons and a responsible producer of products, not just for ESG targets, but more so for the direct health, safety, and well-being of our planet and its people. Thanks, Nishen, for that. Um, I, I think we're then well positioned to get the other side of this partnership's perspective from Thomas. Um, but I think it's also important to think about this here where where we talk about partner partnerships the context is of course so important so um with hypex bio coming into the south african context to partner um with bme um i'm interested to know nitrate free explosive technology has mainly been tested in colder climates and and thomas you spoke about how it's doing well in sweden and um norway i think you said so how is hypex bio testing these explosives in warmer climates with the help of bme and, and how is that going 
Well, thank you, Emily. Uh, so obviously we are Swedish uh, and the way we, we develop technology is always industry aligned. This means that we have partnered with the mining industry here in, in Northern Europe to develop technology that addresses their specific needs. And hence, this is the background of us focusing on colder climate um, technologies, which we have today. Moving into hotter climates, we will face additional challenges or other challenges that we have here in Scandinavia. Uh, the way we normally process this is obviously we, we study together with our partners, in this case BME, we study what is the climate of the market, what type of metallurgies are we looking at, what applications are we looking at, surface mining, are we looking at underground mining, what type of underground mining, and so on and so forth. And then we do methods studies to see what are the specific requirements and the specific handling needed to, uh, to address these targets. And then we normally start with obviously risk studies. We're very safety focused. We do risk studies and then we set up laboratory testing in uh, our facilities here in Sweden. And once we have chemistry, if, once we have application and knowledge about the compositions and let's say um, a way forward a strategy, we communicate that to BME and they, they continue to take that into a larger scale. We go into a pilot phase very likely in, in these climates. And it's important to understand that we're dealing with energetic materials. Uh, energetic materials requires specific consideration in terms of safety and risk, which means that we have to scale. We start with very, very small compositions, very, very small test batches, and then we scale it up. Um, BME's part in this is essential because they have the market knowledge, they have the resources, they have the understanding of the local market, which would, at the first phase, be input and requirements to us to design this. But the next step is to align with the mining industry to start trialing and piloting. And this is an iterative process, and um, which we know here in Sweden, it takes time, but it's also been successful for us to develop, uh, let's say, develop something that the customer actually wants. It's very dangerous to stay too long in a lab because then you tend to be alone with your thoughts and you develop something that the customers you think they want, but at the end, they want something different. So you need to go to the customers as soon as possible. So the partnership is, BME is our enabler. They know the market. They know the application. They know the technology. We don't know the market. We know the technology. So this combination makes us ideally positioned to quickly implement this technology in their market, which is mainly South Africa. Thanks, Thomas. And it really is such an important thing, um, the context in which you operate and how you transition into that new context from an ESG perspective. So it is great to hear that, that thought process that has gone into it. Um, I'm going to come next to Vota. I've got one more question and then there are a few more questions in the chat, um, which I will start asking. Um, the question I want to ask both voters is around um, investors and stakeholders, and it's such an important aspect of ESG is looking at how that flow of investment comes in um, and adheres to ESG, ESG principles. But I'm just flagging that there are a couple of questions also in the chat that relate to this, um, asking about investment and also reporting. So, uh, voter, I'll ask you my question, and then hopefully that'll touch on some of the things that uh, that our attendees have asked in, in the Q&A and feel free to ask more questions if you feel yours wasn't asked, uh, answered from that reporting and investment perspective. Um, so Vota, what impact does ESG have on investors' decision-making and stakeholder confidence? Um, and then a related question to that is investors and stakeholders have to look to reporting standards when it comes to ESG and uh, to determine those investments. Um, do all mining companies apply the same ESG reporting standards and, and what reporting standards have you seen applied in South Africa? Yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, you know, I think, you know, if we if we look at the landscape at this stage, and so I just want to adjust my screen quickly. Um, it is, you know, sorry, just one second. My screen just moved um, without, uh, without me looking at it here. So, yeah, I think, you know, what we're seeing at, at SLK, especially with mergers and acquisitions, is that um, a lot of the deals actually do, um, you know, do hinge quite a bit on ESG um, aspects. You know, we've seen uh, a KPMG survey that was done in 2023, uh, which basically uh, found that Half of deal makers basically uh, walked away from transactions due to ESG or material ESG findings. So, 
you know, it definitely plays a huge role in uh, in the way that um, investors look at at assets. You know, look at companies, and I think also, you know, if you look at stakeholders, um, you know, ESG plays a very, very big, uh, very important role in terms of. I mean, we're involved in the DRC, you know, looking at battery metals um, and, you know, all the standards that are now being applied there. And it's a little bit, you know, we have different standards and I'm going to talk about the standards and I'm going to interlink it in my answer. But, you know, the one reporting aspect is, you know, when you do report, when you've got an established company, you report on stock exchanges, you've got ESG requirements that you need to report to. And then what we're seeing on the ground now, especially with responsible sourcing and responsible mining, is a complete different set of standards that are being applied. And, you know, it it, it, it could be commodity specific, it could be a bit broader. Um, you know, we're seeing aspects like the copper mark, you know, cobalt specific uh, standards that are being applied to which companies need to report, uh, not, not report to, but need to, you know, um, comply with. So, and it's really driven by your car manufacturers, your battery manufacturers downstream, uh, wanting to ensure that their reputational risk is um, is managed and uh, you know that they understand exactly what they are letting themselves into but they also work very closely with the mines in order to um, you know to to ensure that those gaps that are identified are being filled so you know i think what we are seeing is that um, disclosures and you know transparency is becoming so much more important from various aspects you know whether it's from a jse listed a company uh, whether you listed an hong kong stock exchange um, or whether you um, whether you supply um, you know to you know um, to a car or battery manufacturer, you need to ensure that you have a system that can provide environment assurance to your stakeholders and to your investors that you are mining responsibly and that you are p- practicing sustainable uh, practices. So yeah, I think that that kind of um, summarizes it. I'm just trying to keep it brief because it's quite a broad. Um, the broad landscape that you're talking about here at the moment. Thank you, Vota. Um, no, it is indeed a broad landscape, but I think um, I think that that covers it quite well. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions in the chat, and um, some of them are overlapping a bit. So I'm just um, checking which ones we should start with. Um, I've got a question that asks, are companies diverting some of the funds allocated to their environmental rehab as part of their ongoing ESG activities? Um, I thought, Marcus, perhaps you might be well placed to answer that, or if anyone else would also like to st- take a stab as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we were in the early stages of developing projects. So we have environmental rehab guarantees for our exploration or prospecting rights, and we have environmental guarantees um, that meet the requirements of the DMRE um, for our all our um, our mining rights, mining operations. And so those are, it's a legislated um, uh, um, guarantee that you need to have in place. Um, so you know we we certainly haven't diverted anything from 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 any you know from we, they're, they're pretty much locked up those funds. so you can't, you can't divert um, any funding from them. So we've, you know, our 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 approach is that we, um, and, and again, we're we're you know we have, we're not generating revenue yet. So we are re- reliant on 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 our shareholders for anything that we um, that we fund in terms of uh, ESG initiatives. So, um, yeah, I think the answer to that would be not. We're certainly at the stage of of um, of in in the of pipeline progress that we are, we're, we're not doing that. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, I think from a legal perspective, it's true that those funds are locked up. Um, the, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A, which I think are important on um, the role of the S in ESG or the social social considerations. So um, one of the questions is, would you mind clarifying the misconception that ESG is only limited to environmental issues? From my understanding, it's a lot broader than this, specifically the governance and ethics there too. And uh, yeah, there's a couple of other questions that are similar to that. So apologies if I haven't touched on yours specifically. Um, but I'm not sure if anyone would like to answer that. Joshua, um, maybe you could start. Voto, you might have. Um, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe maybe I could give it a stab. Um... Yeah, go for it. Thanks, Nishan. Yeah. If I could answer from a from a mining services perspective, yeah. Companies 
will create the future of the industry in collaboration with surrounding communities. That's where the S comes in. Not despite them, not in, not in isolation, right? And this includes and illustrates the importance of building a clear vision for social engagement and striving to articulate that vision. If the development of whether it's automated mining or electrification or, or innovative nitrate-free solutions is accelerated by ESG uh, challenges, so must the efforts to enrich communities where the minerals are mined. And so the mining industry needs to have a clear mandate to reinvent itself as a highly responsible, highly engaged, essential sector of the business. Um, so, 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 and and these and this mandate can can only be strengthened by initiatives of ESG, as an example. And the S, the social governance perspective, definitely has a large, large uh, part to play in that. I hope that answers the question. Did you want to add something as well? Thanks, Nishin. That that does answer a lot of the question. Yeah, you know, I think you know the focus always was on environmental and you know social and governance uh, used to be um, put on the back burner, but I think mining companies realize that they you know without having um, you know without focusing on the social component that you can't actually operate. You know, you call it like a it's a social license to operate. If you can't uh, if you don't understand the communities that you operate within, if you don't understand the requirements, if you don't communicate with them um, in, in a way that that makes sense. You know, I think you, you're you setting yourself up for, for failure. And a lot of companies have invested a lot of money into um, building better relationships with, relationships with communities, um, ensuring that there are a lot of opportunities to be employed, you know, looking at the human rights aspects, et cetera. Quite a broad, broad aspect. Um, you know, we're also looking at things like the, uh, like GISTM. You know, we, we're looking at tailings management you think, you know, what does a tailings dam have to do with the social environment? But if you start looking at human rights, um, you know, and you're looking at tailings facilities that are that are high risk um, to, to downstream communities, you know, mining companies are taking that a lot more seriously now, looking at those risks. Um, so, you know, it's not only looking at, um, at it, um, you know, it's, it's all the way down from a board level to, to what's actually happening on the ground. We're also seeing in Africa um, many mining companies that are being acquired by um, companies that are situated in different countries, and you know that create really creates social differences. You know you don't understand the culture that you you know that you that you working with in the country that you are moving into, and it's so important then to spend time um, you know understanding these issues, ensure that you employ local labour to assist and facilitate that, that those processes. Uh, so definitely. The social component is really, really, is really uh, in, uh, an important aspect of ESG. Thanks, Vota. I'm actually seeing a flood of questions about the social aspect coming through um, on the Q&A now. So it's definitely something that people are concerned about. And and as you said, I think the environmental has, has sometimes been the kind of focus of ESG. And um, it's so important, of course, to focus that attention back to the S. Another thing that's... Um, been said here on the chat is is if the panel could share their thoughts on how the social needs of communities might be better addressed by mining companies um including understanding the the needs of host communities and um i think that's always a tricky thing from a company perspective is is how much are you actually able to um go in and and address some really serious issues and and um as Vota has has also touched on the context that you're operating in, especially if you're coming in from an international perspective, you know, um it's it's quite a challenge to to understand where to draw that line and how much input you can actually give. Um I don't know if anyone has a further answer on that on on um addressing the needs of host communities. Um Emily, so I don't, you know, I think that's something that <laughs> Is going to be very difficult to have a, a you know authoritative answer on, but you know I just want to comment that I think you know whoever asked that question is spot on because if you look at ESG as you move across, you know the E is provides you the easiest platform uh, of challenges to deal with. You know it's usually is tangible scientific challenges that you can find a solution for that is an objective solution. You know it's either more efficient or less, or it's either, you know, X or Y. 
But as you move on to the social and then even more to the governance, I think it just gets increasingly more complex, nuanced, and um, not as objective. And there's various stakeholders at play. So it's, you know, you tend companies and, and organizations tend to focus on the E because it's almost like the lowest, the lowest hanging fruit. And I think uh, that's where, again, in the industry, we have to realize the ESG space and umbrella is so broad that no one's going to know it all. And we need to leverage and, and, and partner with each other and collaborate to come up with, with the suitable solutions. You know, social is really complex. And even something like governance has evolved to, you know, it's not anymore just about ethical considerations when you talk about governance, but you're talking about efficacy of governance with regards to uh, things like uh, representation. And then there's power and authority uh, issues that come into governance as well, you know, um, decision making and who, who, you know, who's accountable and transparency. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's just quite a lot um, to deal with. And I think it's, it's a reason, there's a risk in that as well. You know, you get it wrong. There's much more chance of getting it wrong on the S and the G. So companies do tend to focus on the E, but, but I think the big, the big understanding is specialization. We need to know ESG is pockets of specialization and you just you know need to know who to go to for what part of that ESG umbrella. There's no one-stop shop for all-encompassing ESG solutions. Thanks, Joshua. I, Vote, I saw you came off mute. Did you want to add something there? Yeah, just something very short. You know, I think it's uh, very, very important to manage community expectations and stakeholder expectations. Um, you know, we've seen quite a few companies, uh, you know, that into 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 a new area, and they make huge commitments at the beginning. And you know, if you can't keep those commitments during your operations, you 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 know, you're setting yourself up for a lot of issues coming in later on. Yeah, thanks, Voto. I think that's so true, and I think I'm I'm glad, Joshua, that you touched on governance a bit more as well. It's it's another part of the the E, the S, and the G that sometimes doesn't get discussed as much. But of course, none of this is possible if we don't deal with it um, effectively from a leadership perspective. Um, I don't actually have a particular question coming through on the Q and A about governance, but I don't know if anyone wants to comment on on leadership within the ESG sp space and. Um, and on how your organizations are managing governance. Um, I think everyone on the on the panel is a leader here. I think Emily, from, from our side, again, focusing on our pillars of data and market-based mechanisms, I think governance is very important in keeping those honest. You know, if you want to talk about market-based mechanisms, you cannot have those consolidate and exist if there's no underlying trust. So there needs to be good quality projects with tangible uh, commodities under it. So carbon reduction must be an actual permanent, real carbon reduction in real life. You know, so, so for us, the governance aspect underpins keeping things honest. So good, strong governance structures allow things to be transparent, kept honest, which then allow data-driven and market-based solutions to consolidate. Um, so that's that's the role of governance in our little pocket that we operate in. Yeah, and I think that also touches on on the issue of greenwashing, which has been mentioned in um, in the Q and A as well, and something we haven't yet spoken about, just in terms of the industry as a whole and whether. Um, that governance is effective in keeping greenwashing at bay. And um, Vota, maybe I can ask you to quickly just touch on this and how we're keeping South African mining companies accountable, ensuring that they don't engage in greenwashing. Yeah, you know, the greenwashing is, uh, it's so it's so difficult to monitor if you don't have proper data and if you don't uh, set proper targets. You know, I think, um, you know, everything is, is data-driven at the moment. We've got um, you know, earlier it was mentioned that we've got, uh, you know, a legal framework is in place. You know, we've got good you've got good guidelines in South Africa on 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 environmental and social issues. Um, but you know, if you think about greenwashing in South Africa, um, a lot of the companies, you know, because there's a lot of decisions are being made in in Europe, um, you know, and it it then gets filtered through to to an African context. Um, you know, I think, first of all, um, companies are grappling with exactly what they need to comply with. And there's a lot of risk in that 
because you can make honest mistakes, you know, so there are honest mistakes and then there are dishonest mistakes. And I think, you know, first of all, you need to understand what are the metrics that you want to compare yourself against? So what frameworks are you going to align with? And what is really applicable to your, to your, to your mind, you know, in, in, in the context of how you set up globally or, or, or locally? So um, first of all, you know, you need to think about that. Um, secondly, and sorry, I'm just uh, taking a step back. Um, you know, in terms of greenwashing, it is important. And what we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a trend in the mining industry now where they are aligning with responsible mining standards like Irma, Coppermark, et cetera, where, um, you know, it provides a, a guideline for them uh, to, to ensure that they can align their operations and um, evaluate the ESG um, um, uh, uh, how can I put it? Um, the ESG of a function in terms of ESG in terms of a, a, a framework. A lot of the mines will will either go for a for a, a responsible mining standard, or they will um, you know use various standards and globally recognized frameworks to uh, create their own. And uh, in that regard, they will then have something that they can can report against. So, you know, from a, you know, take, taking back to your question, how can we hold uh, mining companies of, um, accountable? I think we need, we need to ensure that, and we need to ask mining companies to have an insur assurance mechanism in place. You know, we've got the third party um, auditing the process, um, you know, to ensure that it's, uh, that it's, um, that what is being declared is correct, it's validated. And then I think, you know, also uh, ensuring that mining companies do um, align with, um, with uh, you know, they basically they, they they live what they say, you know, and and I think you you kind of pick it up when uh, a mine um, you know uh, states that 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 it complies with uh, you know all the ESG requirements, um, but you know this we they keep on having community upsets and issues, you know, you know that something's wrong there, but it's not declared and it's not really it's not really dealt with. Um, you know, I, th I think in terms of, you know, if we, you know, there's, there's a lot of focus on greenhouse gas emissions um, at the moment, you know, there's a huge focus on biodiversity. And, you know, it is very important to ensure that, you know, throughout your supply chain or in your own mining operation, that you actually understand how to, to calculate these. Um, you know, if you don't do it properly, then you may, you may actually fully, you know, get into trouble. Thanks, Voto. Yeah, I think this this data driven approach is really coming through very strongly from all of the panelists today. Um, we are running out of time now, um, and I think I'd like to just give each of the panelists a quick closing statement before we wrap up. Um, there might be one or two questions that we haven't got to in the in the Q and A, but thank you so much to everyone for your questions. Um, I'll start with with Thomas. Uh, just any last words from you, Thomas? Well, obviously, thank you so much for having me, but I would say I think this is a very, very interesting space and I think we will see a lot of initiatives, I think, as, as climate change is going to affect our daily lives more and more, both our, our countries. I think that this, this is going to be an urgent issue, both from a regulatory space, but also from innovation. This seems like the, the preferred solution we have is not really to change the way, the way we live, but rather to, to focus on technical solutions, which means the implementation, rapid, quick, effective implementation of technical solutions is going to be crucial, not only for South Africa, but for the global mining industry. And I, for one, am very curious to see how we're going to go about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, I'll go next to Nishen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, team. Great discussion. Um, from my perspective, I think um, ESG, ESG is a commitment, commitment from industry. Yeah. And and it's very necessary that, that whichever industry you're in or whichever service sector you're in um, that supports mining, um, you find frameworks are embedded, underpinned by pillars that can support and, and drive these imperatives. And I think that's that's how we can realize a, 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 a successful ESG outcome. Thanks, Nishen. Marcus, can I come to you next? Yeah, thanks, Emily. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I think certainly from our perspective, we see um, ESG as absolutely critical, a critical part the success of our business as a junior base metals explorer and developer here in South Africa. Uh, and it's absolutely integral to every decision and process that we uh, that we that we follow in the, in the company. In fact, we almost we we also see it as a 
as a competitive advantage. Um, if we can get it right, I think we can, we can um, as we grow, um, I, th I think we can, um, you know, we can, we can actually turn it to our advantage and, and leverage the benefits that come from, from getting ESG uh, right. We're, we're slowly dipping our toes into the whole alphabet soup of the, of the compliance um, uh, um, frameworks and reporting frameworks. Um, but I, I think our approach at the moment is, you know, we're just taking it slowly. Um, we, you know, we're initially just, just starting by um, participating in the voluntary national review of the SDGs. I think they're probably at a high level, they encompass pretty much what a lot of the, or, or most of the other frameworks um, maybe espouse in more detail. Um, but um, yeah, we're absolutely committed. And as we progress our projects, we will evolve our um, reporting and um, measurement frameworks accordingly. Um, thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, I think we'll need another session on reporting separately. <laughs> uh, Joshua, last words from you. Yeah, no, I think it was again great that Marcus uh, actually went in before me and mentioned that about the reporting and the, you know, cautious approach, which I think we've definitely seen in the market, I mean, in, in, in the industry, you know, with where we stand in ESG, we're very much on the cutting edge part. And with that carries a lot of risk. And we've seen a lot of the stakeholders kind of want to sit on the sidelines and kind of see where it's going before really committing um, into any of this. And I think um, it, it, it's, a, it's a sensible approach, but I think also the space has just made so much allowance, you know, for for guys at least just getting involved and getting started with something. So I would say, you know, Marcus, there's a lot of allowance in the frameworks. There's a lot of allowance in the ESG space that uh, you get a lot of kudos just for getting it done. It's you know, first try something, <laughs> and then you can you can focus on, on on getting it right. You know, so I think the fact that we're having this. You know, we've had these series, Crema Media have had these series of talks around ESG it also just shows you how far um, things have come, uh, how far the industry has come in, in ESG and particularly the mining industry from being one of the riskiest activities to, you know, transitioning to where we are now, where we're, you know, leaders in things like Sheck and, and other aspects and other innovations. So I think it just shows how far we've come. ESG has brought big finance to the table. It has, it has made uh, sustainability mainstream. Uh, so now we have the attention. Let's uh, let's get involved and, and and not sit on the sidelines. And then from as practitioners on the on you know from our side, we need to in order to make companies feel comfortable to get involved and not just sit on the sidelines. We need to ensure we consolidate and don't keep changing the goalpost. And uh, you know if goalposts change and people get burnt, more people are just going to sit on the sidelines. So we have to focus on integrity, we have to focus on standardization, and we have to try and consolidate and give these companies something tangible to work with. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it goes two prong, you know, get get involved, but let's, let's create something so guys can get involved and know what they're getting involved in. Yeah. Thanks, Joshua. And Voto, the last word is yours. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, I think, you know, if you if you embrace ESG and you incorporate it into your day to day running of your company and you know, all the way down from policy to through to your to your employees um, and to the stakeholders and to the communities you, you operate within and you take that proactive approach, it's, it will make your, your operations a lot easier. And if you do, um, you know, link into the cutting edge technologies, you know, looking at decarbonization, uh, you know, looking at how you reduce energy, et cetera. At the end of the day, you know, you should see that on, on your bottom line, you know, so first of all, you don't need to deal with putting out fires all the time. And at the end of the day, if you see that difference on the bottom line, it should make a difference in your operations. Thanks, Rosa, and thank you so much to everyone in the panel. Um, I think we've covered a lot today, and it's been a really interesting discussion for me as facilitator, so thank you for that. I'll hand over now to Shannon to, to close out the webinar, and thanks everyone for attending. Thanks very much, Emily. That does bring us to the end of our webinar. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our facilitator, Emily Gammon, for enabling a robust and engaging discussion on this important topic affecting the mining industry. Thank you also to our panelists, Vota Yordan from SRK Consulting, Nishen Hari Parsad from BME, Thomas Gustafsson from Hypex Bio, 
Joshua Kilani from Expotential Mining Services, and Marcus Birch from Orion Minerals. We thank our sponsors, SRK Consulting, BME, and Expotential Mining Services for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on ESG and mining, where the panel unpacked the initiatives to promote ESG and sustainability in mining. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We appreciate your participation. Our next webinar takes place on the 17th of July at 2 p.m. and will focus on South Africa's automotive industry, where a panel will discuss navigating global and domestic risks while embracing new opportunities in that industry. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course, and if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at Thank you so much for your time, and goodbye.